Would you welcome Sue Kim as he comes to minister tonight? Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. And not only on a cold winter New England day, but on daylight savings time oh, that's day. Right, that's right. Like, no one's happy when they spring forward. Everyone loves to fall back, but spring forward, no, who's, who likes losing an hour of sleep? If, if you do, man, we'll have the pastors come back up and anoint you and, and pray for you. But um, praise God, any chance I get to preach the word of God is a, is a joy and privilege. Um, it's amazing how 1,900 people can feel like a family. It's unreal, and uh, in two and a half years here, just brothers and sisters, it has just been a real joy. And as I begin today's message today, I want to ask you, what makes you stop? For me, um, anytime I go to a fair, anytime I go to the beach, the one thing my kids know, and my wife knows too, the one thing that will always make me stop is funnel cake. Summer doesn't start for me until I've had a funnel cake, all right? Maybe for some of you, it's a giant sign in a store window. Everything, 50% off. Hallelujah. Maybe for some of you, like a couple of days ago, there was just a beautiful sunset. Maybe it's just a gorgeous sunset. Maybe, um, you know, this week it's going to be 60, 70 degrees out and just out and enjoying nature. What makes you stop? So many things vying for our attention. What makes you stop? What makes you stop in the digital sphere? What clickbait actually gets you to click? Things like 17 true facts you'll never believe. Or after you see this, you'll never eat these five foods again. <laughs> or if you're on your social media, as you're going through your stream and your feed, what makes you stop? What makes you scroll back up to get another look? Many things vie for our attention and many things cause us to stop. But tonight, I want to look at what caught Jesus' attention. What made Jesus stop? Look with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 19, verse 1. Luke chapter 19, verse 1. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Luke chapter 19, verse 1. The Bible says this, He, Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus! Hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. Mm -mm -mm. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today, salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Let's pray together briefly. Lord, would you add a blessing to the reading, the preaching, the hearing, and the doing of your word. In Jesus' matchless and mighty name, amen. Luke chapter 9, verse 51 says that Jesus turned his face towards Jerusalem. For about 10 chapters, Luke continues to repeat Jerusalem, on the way to Jerusalem, on the way to Jerusalem. He had a wonderful ministry, a wonderful life, but now it's time for Jesus to do what he came to do, to die for my sins and yours. So he fixes his gaze he fixes his face towards Jerusalem. And as he's walking along, he comes to Jericho. Jericho, the historic town. It's about a mile from the Jordan River. 1,400 years prior, it was the first city that 
Israelites took by miraculous means. You guys remember the story? They walked around the city. On the seventh day, they walked around, and then they shouted, and the walls came down. They didn't have to fight. God fought for them. To that historic city, 1,400 years later, Jesus comes, and the Bible says he was passing through. Now, Jericho is about 17 miles northeast of Jerusalem. And if you look from Jericho, actually, because Jerusalem's on a hill, you can actually see it from Jericho. And going from Jericho up to Jerusalem was a hike. It's about a 3,400-foot climb. Like, if you, any of you have been to Mount Monadnock, it's like climbing that. Or maybe halfway up the, uh, the uh, what's that mount? Mount Washington. So it's a, it's a long hike that Jesus had to do to get to Jerusalem. But it says his eyes and his gaze were fixed on Jerusalem. Now, archaeological findings have found that Herod the Great built a majestic palace there. It was a place of trade. It was a wonderful place. The weather was warm. There were palm trees, sycamore fig trees, plenty of water. I mean, Jericho was like the first century place where snowbirds would go. You guys know the type. People that are right now in Florida when the real New Englanders yeah. hang around for the four or five months of winter to come. And these people go to Florida and whatever. Come on. Right now, we're here. We're coming to church in the snow. Right? right? Jericho was that in the first century. It was a place where you could go kick back, sit under a palm tree, and sip a pina colada. Mm. That sound good right about now? Eight days. It's about a week before the Passover. Jesus is about to die. If that was me, I would have stopped for a minute. <laughs> Maybe a couple days. I would have found an Airbnb and be like, hey, let me hang out here for a few days. I got a big thing to do in a couple days. Let me hang out here. But the Bible says that Jesus just passed through. Didn't catch his attention. Did not even stop in Jericho. And in Jericho, we meet a man. The man's name was Zacchaeus, which means righteous. Righteous. A tax collector named Zacchaeus. And the Bible says that he was a chief tax collector. Now, tax collecting at the time was not like today. There was no rule that you could only collect 6.25% maybe a 0.75 city tax on food. There was no rule that you couldn't collect taxes on $175 of apparel. There were no tax brackets. At this time, you could give to whatever you want to Rome, what they required, and you could extort from everyone else. Now, this was just a regular tax collector, someone like Levi that Jesus called, someone like Levi that caused a great uproar. People were like, he's hanging out with Levi? This was the chief tax collector. Now, that term chief tax collector doesn't occur in any other Greek literature. So we don't really know what a chief tax collector was, but we can imagine, can't we? We can imagine that he's got tax collectors beneath him. We can imagine that he's worked hard to climb that ladder of tax collecting. And we can imagine that Zacchaeus was good at getting your money. Zacchaeus was good at it. If you owed something to Rome, Zacchaeus would take it and more. This was a chief tax collector. He could buy anything. He had wealth. He had power. He had authority. All that glittered in this world was his. People knew his name. This was Zacchaeus. So we're surprised to read what's next. It's a bit shocking. In verse 3, it says, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. Now, the word there in the original language has a connotation that this wasn't just, oh, Jesus is in town, let me go see him. What it has a connotation of is he'd been seeking for some time to see who Jesus was. Now, if I could go back in time, I would talk with him. I'd say, Z Zacchaeus, can I call you Zach? Zach, why did you want to see Jesus? You know, Zach, you had all that money could buy. You were rich. You people knew your name. You had authority. All the things that people wanted, you had it. You had favor with Rome. Why did you want to see Jesus? And in fact, Zacchaeus, by this point, Jesus was rumored to be the Messiah. He had calmed the storms. He caused the blind to see. He caused the lame to walk. People were saying, he might be the one. 
Zach, why did you want to sin? Because if he is the Messiah, Zach, this corrupt system that you built your wealth on is gone. Your wealth is gone, Zacchaeus. Because Jesus, the Messiah, was supposed to come and restore Jerusalem, was supposed to restore Israel, restore the people of God to their glorious place. Why did you want to see Jesus? We don't know why he wanted to see Jesus. The Bible doesn't tell us. But we can imagine, can't we? Zacchaeus was a man who was at the top of his game. But maybe it was a game that was no longer worth playing. Zacchaeus had all the things that mo- had all the money to buy anything he wanted. But you can't buy friendship. He had the best clothes to cover him. But maybe it was covering and concealing a broken, joyless, and hopeless heart. The Bible says that Zacchaeus was rich, but Zacchaeus was actually poor in spirit. But there was a problem. You guys know the song. Sing it with me. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Yeah. All right, so some of you guys went to Sunday school. Zacchaeus was short. He wanted to see. He had been seeking to see who Jesus was. But remember, there was a crowd now. Remember, Pastor Tim preached out of blind Bartimaeus, out of Mark. He caused the blind to see. Bartimaeus cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he saw. Before that, there was a woman who'd been suffering for 12 years just by touching his cloak, instantly healed. Jesus walked on water. Jesus fed thousands. By now, there's a crowd. Luke actually says in chapter 12, there were thousands around him that they were actually trampling one another. Jesus was a first century Black Friday. (laughs) Jesus was a 65-inch 4K TV for $600. Everyone wanted a piece. Everyone was willing to trample on each other. Jesus, let me just touch his cloak. I've got someone sick. I'm, I'm sick. I, I need Jesus. Giant crowd. And this crowd is following. So Zacchaeus is trying to get around this crowd, but he's short. So he's, he's, he's jumping and he's trying to see, but he can't see Jesus because he's short. He can't see him. But unlike the rich young ruler in chapter 18 who went away sad, Zacchaeus was determined. Zacchaeus would not be deterred. Zacchaeus hiked up his robe and ran. Now, for us, that might not mean that much. But in the first century, men don't run. And especially not men of power and dignity. Children run. So Zacchaeus runs ahead and he's like, ah, I need to see G. What do I do? What do I? So he sees a sycamore tree. Now, sycamore fig trees could grow pretty big, 50 to 60 feet, but they had a big trunk and low-hanging branches with giant leaves. So he probably climbed up this tree and was hiding behind a branch and a little leaf. Again, climbing might not seem like a big deal to us, but in that day, children climb. Not men of authority, but none of that mattered to Zacchaeus anymore. His place, his authority, his place in society didn't matter. He needed to see Jesus. So he gets in the tree. And get, get in the tree with Jesus. I like Zacchaeus with me. As he's looking, looking to see Jesus. He's, he's in the tree. He's hiding. He's trying not to be seen by Jesus. And he's looking and he's looking. And the crowd's starting to come. You can hear the footsteps of thousands of people coming towards you. Look and you hear Jesus, Jesus. People are, people are bringing maybe a paralyzed friend on a mat. Maybe people are bringing their children to be blessed by Jesus. Maybe people are bringing the blind, the lame, the leprous. They're all coming to Jesus. And Zacchaeus is looking up in the tree saying, which one is he? Which one is, is it, is it him? What's he looking at? Is he looking at Jerusalem? He's, he's just staring at Jerusalem. He's staring in the direction of Jerusalem. And Jesus and the crowd come. And they come and they come and they come. And again, if I could go back in time, I would ask Zach, Zach, 
What were, what were you thinking? You're in the tree. If you saw Jesus, what were you thinking? We don't know what he was thinking, but we know that he had to see Jesus. And Jesus and the crowd are walking along. They're walking along, and then Jesus just stops. He was looking at Jerusalem, but then his eyes look up. The whole crowd stops, and he looks up, and he says, Zacchaeus! How did Jesus know Zacchaeus' name? The Bible doesn't really tell us. He was fully human, but fully divine. Maybe he heard of Zacchaeus' reputation. We don't know. But he calls Zacchaeus by name. See, one nice thing about being in a Christian family is you don't need to know each other's names. You can say, hey, sister. Hey, brother. And it's perfectly fine, perfectly acceptable. Not for Jesus. Jesus calls him by name. He says, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. For those of you who are parents, you can sense the urgency in Jesus' voice, can't you? You've probably said it before on the day for school, right? Hurry up and come down, for we're going to be late today. <laughs> There's urgency in Jesus' voice. Now, can you imagine what it must have been to be Zacchaeus, hiding behind the tree? Zacchaeus, you hear your name. You come out behind the tree. How does he know my name? People call me a sinner. When I approach people, <laughs> Zacchaeus, how are you, Zacchaeus? And then when I walk away, like, they call me a traitor. People hate me. And yet Jesus knows me by name. There's urgency in Jesus' voice. And if it was me, I would have fallen out of the tree. But it says that Zacchaeus ran down. He hurried and came down to receive him joyfully. This really echoes Luke 15, the reception of what happens when the lost are found. When the lost are found. What a beautiful sight. Zacchaeus was seeking to see Jesus, but Jesus was actually seeking to see him. And he knew him by name. I don't know what brought you to church today, but do you know he knows you by name? I don't know what you're going through. But he meant for you to drive through that snow and be here and be in that seat that you're in right now. And he wants to tell you that he knows you by name. He calls you by name. You're not just some stranger to him. You, he knows you by name. Then they go. They move from there, from the tree. They go to Zacchaeus' house. What do you think they were talking about? Wouldn't you have loved to be a fly on that wall? Like, what was Jesus talking about here? What was he telling Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector? But the Bible says that when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Some rabbi. Jesus, you can hang out with the prostitutes. You can hang out with the tax collectors. You can hang out with the blind, the leprous. But not him, Jesus. Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector, an enemy of ours, a friend of Rome, a traitor, who you dine with says a lot about you. You're going to want to be seen with him? That day, Jesus' Twitter handle lost some followers. <laughs> that day, Jesus' YouTube channel lost some subscribers. People were like, nope, that's not my God. Mm-mm. My God can't show grace and mercy to that guy. Right. Oh, but our God does. Amen. Our God does. And let's see the result. With all this, you can imagine the scene, can't you? Zacchaeus and Jesus are dining at the table and he hears all these people grumbling. And Zacchaeus stands up and he says, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. Remember, Zacchaeus was rich. This is a faith promise Sunday. Hallelujah. And not only that, he says, if I have defrauded, if. How many of you guys know when a man starts, especially a husband, starts a statement, if I have? Like, honey, 
if I said something, if I said that, please, no, I said it. I said it, I meant what she, exactly how she interpreted it. If, of course he's defrauded. If I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Leviticus and Numbers say that if you have extorted anyone, you need to pay restitution and give back a fifth, 20%. Zacchaeus gives 400%. Dining with Jesus completely changed Zacchaeus. Matthew 5 says that blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. This man who was physically rich, but spiritually poor, in an instant became physically poor, but having that which no one could take away from him. Having the kingdom of God. And I want you to notice the order here. Zacchaeus didn't have to get his house in order. He didn't have to repent first before Jesus dined with him. You don't have to clean up your life for Jesus to accept you for who you are. Jesus touched the blind. Jesus touched the leprous. And what was supposed to happen was that that sin, that sickness was supposed to transfer to that person that touched him. But instead, because of who Jesus is, he made that which is unholy and unclean holy and restored. And this is who we are too. We're to be like that. So in an instant, this man Zacchaeus, his life has changed. He went, in a matter of hours, he went from climbing a tree to see who Jesus was to having the kingdom of God. And Jesus said to him in verse 9, today, turn to your neighbor and say, today. 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 today, salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. This word today foreshadows what the thief would say on the what he would say to the thief on the cross. Today you will be with me in paradise. When Jesus speaks in a moment you can be saved. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what you came in here carrying, but in an instant at the word of Jesus, today you can have salvation. Today, everything can change. This man who was unclean, who lost every right to the inheritance, Jesus restores that to him. He says, since he also is a son of Abraham. But the great news is, brothers and sisters, Galatians 3.29 says this, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to, their, to that promise. That's our promise too. And then this amazing statement, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This was Jesus' mission statement. Calvary Christian Church, this must be our mission statement. Jesus didn't come to institute a religion. Jesus didn't even come to do miracles primarily. He didn't even come to teach primarily. What Luke says he came to do was to seek and save the lost. Jesus stopped for Zacchaeus. So I want to ask the musicians to come up. And as we close, I want to ask you again, what makes you stop? A week before he would be betrayed, a week before he would give his life, Jesus says, I have to stop. I've got to stop at this tree and I've got to dine with you today, Zacchaeus. What makes us stop? What makes us stop? Jesus would say in his ministry and throughout his ministry, the harvest is plentiful, but laborers are few. That's why in six weeks we're launching Calvary Danvers. Because the harvest is plentiful, plentiful, but laborers are few. I'm praying for a move of the Holy Spirit in Danvers, the likes of which we've never seen before. Some of you are in this room, you're praying for breakthrough. You're praying, God, answer my prayer. God, this thing that I've been praying for for days, for weeks, for months, for years, for decades, for my life, answered. I want breakthrough. What if I told you that you might be the breakthrough for someone's prayers? What if one of your coworkers has been praying to an unknown God? If you're out there, 
Save my marriage. If you're out there, take depression away from my son. If you're out there, help me. What if you're the answer to that prayer? Instead of us being focused on God answering our prayers, giving us breakthrough, what if we are the breakthrough for people? What if we are the breakthrough for Danvers? What if God has prepared a harvest for us? Will we stop for the harvest? Jesus stopped for the harvest. And we must stop for the harvest. A couple reasons why we might not stop. One reason is, you might say, that person can never get saved. They have everything they need in life. They, they don't need Jesus. They don't need Jesus. Zacchaeus needed Jesus. Where we're going in Thailand, there's a remarkable movement that's happening. Where pop stars got saved. Thai pop stars. And they started making Christian music and people are starting to get saved in a country where there's 200 years of missionary efforts. With still 1% Christian, God is using pop stars to put music into young people's brains about Christ. Out of Isaiah of all things. And that's because someone stopped and said, I don't know Jesus, but Holy Spirit, you're telling me to share with this pop star. I don't think he needs it, but I'll share anyway. That pop star got saved, and here's the harvest. With Jesus, everyone can get saved. We're all broken. We're all broken. And I don't care if you've been walking with the Lord for a day, 50 plus years, I don't care how long you've been walking with the Lord, we never outgrow our need of grace. I tell my children every day, hey, <laughs> when you're 30, will you still cuddle me? Will you still tell me you love me? Amen. Because I don't care how old my kids get, they will never outgrow my love. We go back to Maryland, there's artifacts of things that my children have outgrown. There's Dora the Explorer that my girls could not care less about. There are Anna and Elsa that they had to have all of it. Now they've outgrown it, but they'll never outgrow their need for my love. It doesn't matter how long you've been walking with God, you will never outgrow your need for grace, your need for mercy. Maybe for some of you, it's been a long time since you've remembered Jesus calling you by name. Maybe you need to spend some time at these altars tonight to remember that he calls you by name. Because the second reason why we don't stop is maybe we think, I don't know everything about God. I don't know. I, I didn't go to seminary. What am I supposed to I didn't go to Bible college. I don't know everything. Brothers and sisters, the good news is not that you know everything about God. The good news is that Jesus Christ knows your name. So whatever's causing you to stop, listen to the Holy Spirit in your daily life. Who is he asking you to stop for? Who are you the answer for? Whose personal breakthrough are you? This church has been breakthrough for thousands because we stopped for the harvest. We didn't say we're going to build a big, that was, that's not the goal. The goal is the harvest, to keep the main thing the main thing. This church has grown because we've stopped. We've stopped and given to missions. So Calvary Christian Church, will you stop? Stop for the harvest. Let's bow our hearts and minds for a word of prayer. As all to workers come. And maybe for some of you in this room, this is the first time that Jesus has called you by name. And if that's you, please come up and pray. If you're a man, pray with a man. If you're a woman, pray with a woman. And we would love to welcome you to the family of God. But for the rest of us, I want to invite us to spend some moment around these altars. Spend some moment in your pew. Who is Jesus asking you to stop for? Abba, Father, we come today and say, forgive us for not having your heart. 
Forgive us when our program is not your program, Jesus. Forgive us when our mission is not your mission. Bring us back to your heart. Bring us back to the main thing being the main thing, Jesus, tonight. Give us wisdom and discernment for who to stop for, a coworker, a classmate. Maybe for some of us dads, as we're having the men's breakfast on Saturday, maybe it's to stop for our kids, to stop being so busy and stop and tell them what Jesus says about them. Give us your heart, Jesus, that we would build our lives on this, God, that we would build our lives on your eternal word, that we would see Linfield, that we would see Danvers, that we would see the North Shore entirely changed because you said the harvest is plentiful, but labors are few. Jesus, we're going to be laborers in this harvest field, and we're going to stop for the harvest. So I'm going to invite the praise team to sing a song. And if you want to come up and spend some moments around these altars. Thank you, Jesus.